Chapter One of The Wrong Box. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For further information, or to volunteer, please go to LibriVox.org. Reading by Andy Minter. The Wrong Box by Robert Louis Stevenson and Lloyd Osborne. Chapter One in which Morris suspects. How very little does the amateur, dwelling at home at ease, comprehend the labours and perils of the author, and when he smilingly skims the surface of a work of fiction, how little does he consider the hours of toil, consultation of authorities, researches in the Bodleian, correspondence with learned and illegible Germans, in one word, the vast scaffolding that was first built up, and then knocked down, to while away an hour for him in a railway train. Thus I might begin this tale with a biography of Tonti, birthplace, parentage, genius, probably inherited from his mother, remarkable instance of precocity, etc., and a complete treatise on the system to which he bequeathed his name. The material is all beside me in a pigeonhole, but I scorn to appear vainglorious. Tonti is dead and I never saw any one who even pretended to regret him. And as for the tontine system, a word will suffice for all the purposes of this unvarnished narrative. A number of sprightly youths, the more the merrier, put up a certain sum of money, which is then funded in a pool under trustees. Coming on for a century later, the proceeds are fluttered for a moment in the face of the last survivor, who is probably deaf, so that he cannot even hear of his success, and who is certainly dying, so that he might just as well have lost. The peculiar poetry and even humour of the scheme is now apparent, since it is one by which nobody concerned can possibly profit, but its fine sportsmanlike character endeared it to our grandparents. When Joseph Finsbury and his brother Masterman were little lads in white frilled trousers, their father, a well-to-do merchant in Cheapside, caused them to join a small but rich tontine of seven-and-thirty lives. A thousand pounds was the entrance fee, and Joseph Finsbury can remember to this day the visit to the lawyers, where the members of the tontine, all children like himself, were assembled together, and sat in turn in the big office chair, and signed their names, with the assistance of a kind old gentleman in spectacles and Wellington boots. He remembers playing with the children afterwards on the lawn at the back of the lawyer's house, and a battle royal that he had with a brother Tontina who had kicked his shins. The sound of war called forth the lawyer from where he was dispensing cake and wine to the assembled parents in the office, and the combatants were separated, and Joseph's spirit, for he was the smaller of the two, commended by the gentleman in the Wellington boots, who vowed that he had been just such another at the same age. Joseph wondered to himself if he had worn at that time little Wellingtons and a little bald head, and when, in bed at night, he grew tired of telling himself stories of sea-fights, he used to dress himself up as the old gentleman, and entertain other little boys and girls with cake and wine. In the year 1840 the thirty-seven were all alive. In 1850 their numbers had decreased by six. In 1856 and 1857 business was more lively, for the Crimea and the mutiny carried off no less than nine. There remained in 1870 but five of the original members, and at the date of my story, including the two Finsburys, but three. By this time Masterman was in his seventy-third year. He had long complained of the effects of age, having long since retired from business, and now lived in absolute seclusion under the roof of his son Michael, the well-known solicitor. Joseph, on the other hand, was still up and about, and still presented but a semi-venerable figure on the streets in which he loved to wander. This was the more to be deplored, because Masterman had led, even to the least particular, a model British life, industry, regularity, respectability, and a preference for the four per cents are understood to be the very foundations of a green old age. All these Masterman had eminently displayed, and here he was, Abagendo, at seventy-three, while Joseph, barely two years younger, and in the most excellent preservation, had disgraced himself through life by idleness and eccentricity. 
Embarked in the leather trade, he had early wearied of business, for which he was supposed to have small parts. A taste for general information, not properly checked, had soon begun to sap his manhood. There is no passion more debilitating to the mind, unless perhaps it be that itch of public speaking which it not infrequently accompanies or begets. The two were conjoined in the case of Joseph. The acute stage of this double malady, that in which the patient delivers gratuitous lectures, soon declared itself with severity, and not many years had passed over his head before he would have travelled thirty miles to address an infant school. He was no student. His reading was confined to elementary textbooks and the daily papers. He did not even fly as high as cyclopedias. Life, he would say, was his volume. His lectures were not meant, he would declare, for college professors. They were addressed direct to the great heart of the people, and the heart of the people must certainly be sounder than its head, for his lucubrations were received with favour. That entitled, How to Live Cheerfully on Forty Pounds a Year, created a sensation among the unemployed. Education, its aims, objects, purposes, and desirability, gained him the respect of the shallow-minded. As for his celebrated essay on life insurance regarded in its relation to the masses, read before the Working Men's Mutual Improvement Society, Isle of Dogs, it was received with a literal ovation by an unintelligent audience of both sexes, and so marked was the effect that he was next year elected honorary president of the institution, an office of less than no emolument, since the holder was expected to come down with a donation but one which highly satisfied his self-esteem. While Joseph was thus building himself up a reputation among the more cultivated portion of the ignorant, his domestic life was suddenly overwhelmed by orphans. The death of his younger brother Jacob saddled him with the charge of two boys, Morris and John, and in the course of the same year his family was still further swelled by the addition of a little girl, the daughter of John Henry Hazeltine, Esquire a gentleman of small property and fewer friends. He had met Joseph only once, at a lecture-hall in Holloway, but from that formative experience he returned home to make a new will, and consign his daughter and her fortune to the lecturer. Joseph had a kindly disposition, and yet it was not without reluctance that he accepted this new responsibility, advertised for a nurse, and purchased a second-hand perambulator. Morris and John he made more readily welcome, not so much because of the tie of consanguinity, as because the leather business, in which he hastened to invest their fortune of thirty thousand pounds, had recently exhibited inexplicable symptoms of decline. A young but capable Scot was chosen as manager to the enterprise, and the cares of business never again afflicted Joseph Finsbury. Leaving his charges in the hands of the capable Scot, who was married, he began his extensive travels on the continent and in Asia Minor. With a polyglot testament in one hand and a phrase-book in the other, he groped his way among the speakers of eleven European languages. The first of these guides is hardly applicable to the purposes of the philosophic traveller, and even the second is designed more expressly for the tourist than for the expert in life. But he pressed interpreters into his service, whenever he could get their services for nothing, and by one means and another filled many notebooks with the result of his researches. In these wanderings he spent several years, and only returned to England when the increasing age of his charges needed his attention. The two lads had been placed in a good but economical school, where they had received a sound commercial education, which was somewhat awkward, as the leather business was by no means in a state to court inquiry. In fact, when Joseph went over his accounts, preparatory to surrendering his trust, he was dismayed to discover that his brother's fortune had not increased by his stewardship, even by making over to his two wards every penny he had in the world that would still be a deficit of seven thousand eight hundred pounds. When these facts were communicated to the two brothers in the presence of a lawyer, Morris Finsbury threatened his uncle with all the terrors of the law, and was only prevented from taking extreme steps by the advice of the professional man. "'You cannot get blood from a stone,' observed the lawyer. Anne Morris saw the point, and came to terms with his uncle. On the one side, Joseph gave up all that he possessed, 
and assigned to his nephew his contingent interest in the tontine, already quite a hopeful speculation. On the other, Morris agreed to harbour his uncle and Miss Hazeltine, who had come to grief with the rest, and to pay to each of them one pound a month as pocket-money. The allowance was amply sufficient for the old man. It scarce appears how Miss Hazeltine contrived to dress upon it, but she did, and what is more, she never complained. She was, indeed, sincerely attached to her incompetent guardian. He had never been unkind. His age spoke for him loudly. There was something appealing in his whole-souled quest of knowledge, an innocent delight in the smallest mark of admiration, and though the lawyer had warned her she was being sacrificed, Julia had refused to add to the perplexities of Uncle Joseph. In a large, dreary house in John Street, Bloomsbury, these four dwelt together, a family in appearance, in reality a financial association. Julia and Uncle Joseph were, of course, slaves. John, a gentleman with a taste for the banjo, the music hall, the gaiety bar, and the sporting papers, must have been anywhere a secondary figure, and the cares and delights of empire devolved entirely upon Morris. That these are inextricably intermixed is one of the commonplaces with which the bland essayist consoles the incompetent and the obscure. But in the case of Morris, the bitter must have largely outweighed the sweet. He grudged no trouble to himself. He spared none to others. He called the servants in the morning. He served out the stores with his own hand. He took soundings of the sherry. He numbered the remainder biscuits. Painful scenes took place over the weekly bills, and the cook was frequently impeached, and the tradespeople came and hectored with him in the back parlour upon a question of three farthings. The superficial might have deemed him a miser. In his own eyes he was simply a man who had been defrauded. The world owed him seven thousand eight hundred pounds, and he intended that the world should pay. But it was in his dealings with Joseph that Morris's character particularly shone. His uncle was a rather gambling stock, in which he had invested heavily, and he spared no pains in nursing the security. The old man was seen monthly by a physician, whether he was well or ill. His diet, his raiment, his occasional outings, now to Brighton, now to Bournemouth, were doled out to him like pap to infants. In bad weather he must keep the house. In good weather, by half-past nine, he must be ready in the hall. Morris would see that he had gloves, and that his shoes were sound, and the pair would start for the leather business, arm in arm. The way there was probably dreary enough, for there was no pretence of friendly feeling. Morris had never ceased to upbraid his guardian with his defalcation, and to lament the burden of Miss Hazeltine. And Joseph, though he was a mild enough soul, regarded his nephew with something very near akin to hatred. But the way there was nothing to the journey back for the mere sight of the place of business, as well as every detail of its transactions, was enough to poison life for any Finsbury. Joseph's name was still over the door. It was he who still signed the cheques, but this was only policy on the part of Morris, and designed to discourage other members of the tontine. In reality, the business was entirely his, and he found it an inheritance of sorrows. He tried to sell it, and the offers he received were quite derisory. He tried to extend it, and it was only the liabilities he succeeded in extending. To restrict it, and it was only the profits he managed to restrict. Nobody had ever made money out of that concern, except the capable Scott, who retired, after his discharge, to the neighbourhood of Banff, and built a castle with his profits. The memory of this fallacious Caledonian Morris would revile daily, as he sat in the private office opening his mail, with old Joseph at another table, sullenly awaiting orders, or savagely affixing signatures to he knew not what. And when the man of the heather pushed cynicism so far as to send him the announcement of his second marriage, uh, to Davidia, elder daughter of the Reverend Alexander McCraw, it was really supposed that Morris would have a fit. Business hours in the Finsbury leather trade had been cut to the quick. Even Morris's strong sense of duty to himself was not strong enough to dally within those walls and under the shadow of that bankruptcy, and presently the manager and clerks would draw a long breath, and compose themselves for another day of procrastination. Raw haste, on the authority of my Lord Tennyson, is half-sister to delay, but the business habits are certainly her uncle's. 
Meanwhile, the leather merchant would lead his living investment back to John Street like a puppy-dog, and having there immured him in the hall, would depart for the day on the quest of seal-rings, the only passion of his life. Joseph had more than the vanity of man, he had that of lecturers. He owned he was in fault, although more sinned against, by the capable Scot, than sinning, but had he steeped his hands in gore, he would still not deserve to be thus dragged at the chariot-wheels of a young man, to sit a captive in the halls of his own leather business, to be entertained with mortifying comments on his whole career, to have his costume examined, his collar pulled up, the presence of his mittens verified, and to be taken out and brought home in custody, like an infant with a nurse. At the thought of it his soul would swell with venom, and he would make haste to hang up his hat and coat, and the detested mittens, and slink upstairs to Julia and his notebooks. The drawing-room at least was sacred from Morris. It belonged to the old man and to the young girl. It was there that she made her dresses. It was there that he inked his spectacles over the registration of disconnected facts, and the calculation of insignificant statistics. Here he would sometimes lament his connection with the tontine. "'If it were not for that,' he cried one afternoon, "'he would not care to keep me. I might be a free man, Julia, and I could so easily support myself by giving lectures.' "'To be sure you could,' said she. "'And I think it one of the meanest things he ever did to deprive you of that amusement. There were those nice people at the Isle of Cats, wasn't it, who wrote and asked you so very kindly to give them an address.' I did think he might have let you go to the Isle of Cats. "'He is a man of no intelligence,' cried Joseph. "'He lives here, literally surrounded by the absorbing spectacle of life, and for all the good it does him he might just as well be in his coffin. Think of his opportunities. The heart of any other young man would burn within him at the chance. The amount of information that I have it in my power to convey, if he would only listen, is a thing that beggars language, Julia. "'Whatever you do, my dear, you mustn't excite yourself,' said Julia. "'For you know, if you look at all ill, the doctor will be sent for.' "'That is very true,' returned the old man humbly. "'I will compose myself with a little study.' He thumbed his gallery of notebooks. "'I wonder,' he said, "'I wonder, since I see that your hands are occupied, "'Whether it might not interest you?' "'Why, of course it would,' cried Julia. "'Read me one of your nice stories. There's a dear.' He had the volume down, and his spectacles on his nose in stanta, as though to forestall some possible retraction. "'What I propose to read to you,' said he, skimming through the pages, "'is the notes of a highly important conversation with a Dutch courier of the name of David Abbas, which is the Latin for Abbot.' Its results are so well worth the money it cost me, for, as Abbas at first appeared somewhat impatient, I was induced to, what I believe singularly called, stand him drink. It runs only to about five and twenty pages. Yes, here it is. He cleared his throat, and began to read. Mr. Finsbury, according to his own report, contributed about four hundred and ninety-nine five-hundredths of the interview, and elicited from Abbas literally nothing. It was dull for Julia, who did not require to listen, for the Dutch courier, who had to answer, it must have been a perfect nightmare. It would seem as if he had consoled himself by frequent appliances to the bottle. It would even seem that, towards the end, he had ceased to depend on Joseph's frugal generosity, and called for the flagon on his own account. The effect, at least, of some mellowing influence was visible in the record. Abbas became suddenly a willing witness. He began to volunteer disclosures, and Julia had just looked up from her seam with something like a smile, when Morris burst into the house, eagerly calling for his uncle, and the next instant plunged into the room, waving in the air the evening paper. It was indeed with great news that he came charged. The demise was announced of Lieutenant-General Sir Glasgow Bigger, KCSI, KCMG, etc., and the prize of the tontine now lay between the Finsbury brothers. Here was Morris's opportunity at last. The brothers had never, it is true, been cordial. When word came that Joseph was in Asia Minor, Masterman had expressed himself with irritation. "'I call it simply indecent,' 
he had said, "'Mark my words, we shall hear of him next at the North Pole!' And these bitter expressions had been reported to the traveller on his return. What was worse, Masterman had refused to attend the lecture on education, its aims, objects, purposes, and desirability, although invited to the platform. Since then the brothers had not met. On the other hand, they never had openly quarrelled. Joseph, by Morris's orders, was prepared to waive the advantage of his juniority. Masterman had enjoyed all through life the reputation of a man neither greedy nor unfair. Here, then, were all the elements of compromise assembled, and Morris, suddenly beholding his seven thousand eight hundred pounds restored to him, and himself dismissed from the vicissitudes of the leather trade, hastened the next morning to the office of his cousin Michael. Michael was something of a public character. Launched upon the law at a very early age, and quite without protectors, he had become a trafficker in shady affairs. He was known to be the man for a lost cause. It was known that he could extract testimony from a stone, an interest from a gold-mine, and his office was besieged in consequence by all that numerous class of persons who have still some reputation to lose, and find themselves upon the point of losing it, by those who have made undesirable acquaintances, who have mislaid a compromising correspondence, or who are being blackmailed by their own butlers. In private life Michael was a man of pleasure, but it was thought his dire experience at the office had gone far to sober him, and it was known that, in the matter of investments, he preferred the solid to the brilliant. What was yet more to the purpose, he had been all his life a consistent scoffer at the Finsbury Tontine. It was, therefore, with little fear for the result, that Morris presented himself before his cousin, and proceeded feverishly to set forth his scheme. For near upon a quarter of an hour the lawyer suffered him to dwell upon its manifest advantages uninterrupted. Then Michael rose from his seat, and, ringing for his clerk, uttered a single clause. "'It won't do, Morris.' It was in vain that the leather merchant pleaded and reasoned, and returned day after day to plead and reason. It was in vain that he offered a bonus of one thousand, of two thousand, of three thousand pounds. In vain that he offered, in Joseph's name, to be content with only one-third of the pool. Still there came the same answer. "'It won't do.' "'I can't see the bottom of this,' he said at last. "'You answer none of my arguments. You haven't a word to say. For my part, I believe it's malice.' The lawyer smiled at him benignly. "'You may believe one thing,' said he. "'Whatever else I do, I am not going to gratify any of your curiosity. You see, I am a trifle more communicative to-day, because this is our last interview upon the subject.' "'Our last interview?' cried Morris. "'The stirrup-cup, dear boy,' returned Michael. "'I can't have my business hours encroached upon. And—' "'By the by, have you no business of your own? Are there no convulsions in the leather trade?' "'I believe it to be malice,' repeated Morris, doggedly. "'You always hated and despised me from a boy.' Oh, "'No, no, not hated,' returned Michael, soothingly. "'I rather like you than otherwise. There's such a permanent surprise about you. You look so dark and attractive from a distance.' Do you know that to the naked eye you look romantic, like what they call a man with a history? And, indeed, from all that I can hear, the history of the leather trade is full of incident. Yes, said Morris, disregarding these remarks. It's no use coming here. I shall see your father. Oh, no, you won't, said Michael. Nobody shall see my father. I should like to know why, cried his cousin. I never make any secret of that, replied the lawyer. He is too ill. If he is as ill as you say, cried the other, the more reason for accepting my proposal. I will see him. Will you? said Michael, and he rose and rang for his clerk. It was now time, according to Sir Faraday Bond, the medical baronet, whose name is so familiar at the foot of bulletins, that Joseph, the poor golden goose, should be removed into the purer air of Bournemouth and for that uncharted wilderness of villas the family now shook off the dust of Bloomsbury. Julia, delighted, 
because at Bournemouth she sometimes made acquaintances. John, in despair, for he was a man of city tastes. Joseph, indifferent where he was, so long as there was pen and ink and daily papers, and he could avoid martyrdom at the office. Morris himself, perhaps not displeased to pre-term it these visits to the city, and have a quiet time for thought. He was prepared for any sacrifice. All he desired was to get his money again, and clear his feet of leather, and it would be strange, since he was so modest in his desires, and the pool amounted to upwards of a hundred and sixteen thousand pounds, it would be strange indeed if he could find no way of influencing Michael. "'If I could only guess his reason,' he repeated to himself. And by day, as he walked in Branksome Woods, and by night, as he turned upon his bed, and at meal-times, when he forgot to eat, and in the bathing-machine, when he forgot to dress himself, that problem was constantly before him. Why had Michael refused? At last, one night, he burst into his brother's room, and woke him. "'What's all this?' asked John. "'Julia leaves this place to-morrow,' replied Morris. "'She must go up to town and get the house ready, and find servants. We shall all follow in three days.' "'Oh, bravo!' cried John. "'But why?' "'I've found it out, John,' returned his brother, gently. "'It? What?' inquired John. "'Why Michael won't compromise?' said Morris. "'It's because he can't. It's because Masterman's dead, and he's keeping it dark.' "'Golly!' cried the impressionable John. "'But what's the use? Why does he do it anyway?' "'To defraud us of the tontine,' said his brother. "'He couldn't.' "'You have to have a doctor's certificate,' objected John. "'Did you never hear of venal doctors?' inquired Morris. "'They're as common as blackberries. You can pick em up for three pound ten a head.' "'I wouldn't do it under fifty if I were a sawbones,' ejaculated John. "'And then Michael,' continued Morris, "'is in the very thick of it. All his clients have come to grief. His whole business is rotten eggs.' If any man could arrange it, he could, and depend upon it, he has his plan all straight, and depend upon it, it's a good one, for he's clever and be done to him. But I'm clever too, and I'm desperate. I lost seven thousand eight hundred pounds when I was an orphan at school. Oh, don't be tedious, interrupted John. You've lost far more already, trying to get it back. End of chapter one.